Now, before we show the film this evening, we are very pleased to have Dr. Claire Eustons, Senior Lecturer in History at the University of Greenwich with us. Claire is going to tell us more about the Women's Freedom League to provide a context for the film. Thanks, Claire. Slides up. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Deirdre, for your introduction. Um, and thank you to Melanie Unwin for organising what has been an excellent Women's History Month programme and for inviting me to talk to you tonight. I'm going to speak for around 20 minutes. Uh, on the early 20th century British suffrage campaign as it was experienced by Muriel Matters and some of her contemporaries. I hope that what I have to say adds to your enjoyment of the film, um, which will follow my, my talk, um, and adds to your appreciation of Muriel and what she did, and also the many other women and men who campaigned for gender equality in the last century. I hope... Um, we will all be inspired to keep asking questions. New questions, the same questions about the past, and perhaps to reflect on why history, why we choose or are encouraged to remember particular individuals, particular moments, particular events, and to forget others, and why that might be. So, Muriel Matters, who was she? I'm not going to preempt the film, and spoil it for you. Instead, what I'm here to talk about tonight is the Women's Freedom League. And this was the suffrage society that Muriel Matters was a member of for the longest period. The slide is a, a postcard that was produced by the Women's Freedom League. Um, to sell, um, Muriel Matters was a popular speaker on their behalf. Um, what can I tell you about the Women's Freedom League to kick us off? Who's heard of it? Who's heard of the Women's Freedom Oh, good, fantastic, excellent. Um, for those of you who haven't, I can tell you the Women's Freedom League was a militant suffrage society. Some members adopted the moniker of suffragette, the term, the, the title suffragette, while others still preferred the term suffragist. Um, its colours were green, white and gold. Um, all of the larger suffrage societies had their own colours. I know you all know the colours of the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU, purple, white and green, but there were other suffrage societies and other colours. Its slogan, it had a slogan, not deeds, um, deeds not words, it's dare to be free was the slogan of the Women's Freedom League. Um, something you may not be familiar with, the Women's Freedom League was founded in 1907. It continued until 1961. That's well over 50 years, but don't worry, I'm not going to talk about the entire 50 years of their existence tonight. I'm only going to cover a fraction of it. Before I start, many of you will recognise uh, what um, the Pankhurst Memorial, just a few minutes walk away um, beyond... Uh, the, um, the Houses of, of, of Parliament. If you haven't ever seen it, do go and see it. The reason it's here, f um, I've put it up here tonight, is because of something I came across quite recently um, in the British Library. Some correspondence written in the late 1950s by former suffragettes regarding the proposals, which also came from former suffragettes, to build a memorial to Christabel Pankhurst, and this memorial was added in 1959, shortly after Christabel's death, to the um, Pankhurst Memorial. So um, um, I find it an interesting memorial um, for what it tells us about the debates that have taken place, the contestation of histories, um, the suffrage histories. Um, most of the suffragettes who objected to the plans to um, uh, build a memorial to Christabel said that they'd accepted that it was okay for um, Emmeline to be commemorated but not Christabel. They made reference to what they considered to be her fleeting involvement in the women's suffrage campaign and they pointed out that many other women had been campaigning for equal voting rights long after Christabel had moved to America 
and pursued other, other campaigns. I've mentioned this because, for me, um, it's part of a long-running and ongoing debate over the scope, the purpose, the achievements of the British Women's Suffrage Campaign and how it should be recorded by history, by historians. It reveals a lot, I think, about what doing history is all about. And I personally do struggle with the extent to which terms like suffragette and votes for women have become tropes, deeply prescriptive phrases that are fixed in meaning. And that's why um, I think, and I hope you agree with me, films like the one we're going to see tonight are so important because I think they help to chip away at those histories that focus on the actions of a minority and they look at personalities rather than ideas. So anyway, back to the Muriel Matters and the Women's Freedom League. Let's see if we can chip away a bit more at some of those, um, those histories. When Muriel arrived in the United Kingdom in 1906, she would have been immediately exposed to the topic of votes for women. It would have been in the press, it would have been discussed at meetings that she may have attended in households in the streets, paper sellers, and obviously in, um, 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 among her colleagues and her, her associates. She could have joined one of the many branches of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies headed up by, I'm sure you all know, Millicent Garrett Fawcett. Um, the National Union had been campaigning for decades um, for um, um, votes for women. Um, but Muriel um, didn't, didn't join the National Union. Along with thousands of other women, she was attracted to the, a newer society that had brought energy and a sense of urgency and, and, yes, militancy to the women's suffrage movement. And this was the Women's Social and Political Union, which, as most of you, I'm sure, know, was started in 1903 in Manchester um, by a small group of, of women who, who essentially came from um, a network of radical socialist um, um, labour networks in the area. In 1905, some of the members embarked on a new campaign of confrontation of dissent, primarily against the Liberal government, and their protests at meetings and other provocative actions, yes, like window smashing, led to their arrest and imprisonment and a frenzied amount of press interest. Muriel Matters herself later recalled, and I'm quoting her, within six weeks of landing, I was attending the meetings in Caxton Hall, drinking in all your rebellious sentiments, applauding you, longing with all my heart to be with you. And in 1906, Muriel had a fairly straightforward choice to join a suffrage society that was law-abiding or one that wasn't. And she chose, yes, she chose the latter. Had she arrived a few years later, she would have had dozens of different societies to choose from, representing a plethora of professional, creative and political interests. And the point I think I'm making here is that the women's suffrage campaign at the time that Muriel arrived in, in the UK was one of the significant political issues in Britain at this time. And the organisational infrastructure behind this campaign, the movement, was rapidly expanding. As said, Muriel ended up in the Women's Social and Political Union. How then did she become a member of the Women's Freedom League? Well, as I've said, this rapidly expanding um, um, network and the sheer numbers of women and men who were choosing to act on their interest and their belief that women should have the vote by joining societies. And this, this growth, this rapid growth, brought with it significant challenges. And in order to bring um, some coherence, um, it was thought and coordination to what was really an unprecedented mobilisation of women, a constitution was adopted by the Women's Social and Political Union, and this set out how this organisation would operate. And it stipulated that ordinary members, rank and farm members, would have a say in how the society was run and how policy was developed. This would be um, discussed at an annual conference of branches. I mean, it's all fairly standard stuff. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Fairly standard stuff for um, societies, formation of societies at this time. However, there was an influential group, including Emmeline and Christopher Pankhurst, who didn't like the limitations they felt a constitution imposed upon them. 
And in sem September 1907, Emmeline Pankhurst moved. Um, she counted, I think, on her personal popularity among the rank and farm members. Um, she moved and she decided she announced the conference was cancelled. She called it a distraction. And she announced that the battle, as she called the campaign, would be directed by her and a number of other individuals, essentially a small committee. However, um, Charlotte Despard, Teresa Billington Greig, the names up on, on the slide, Edith Hal Martin, dissented from this view, and they went ahead with the conference without the Pankhursts in October 1907. About 30 of the then, that what, were, what was about 70, 75 branches of the Women's Social and Political Union attended um, the conference. And of those 30, about 12, or some people say about 20% of the membership, decided to continue as a democratic society. After some wrangling where both wings were claiming to be the true, the original WSPU, the 12 branches and the leaders decided to adopt a new name, and the name they adopted was the Women's Freedom League. Okay, I've gone into a lot of detail there, but what, you know, what should we make of these events? Well, they can be read in all sorts of different ways, and, and I'm only going to focus on, on, on one dimension to this split. And that's the extent to which I think it's possible to see in this disagreement um, this, this split in the, in the movement, the emergence of a more coherent analysis by women of the need for change in gender relations, a change that went far belong, beyond sorry, the short-term goal of votes for women. The preoccupation, and I think it was a preoccupation, of those women like Charlotte Despard, Theresa Billington Greig, who formed the Women's Freedom League, with building a representative democratic infrastructure to their society is evidence, I think, of their intent. Their intent that after what they hoped would be, what everyone hoped and some genuinely believe would be a short-term campaign for political rights for women, they would build upon this um, um, to secure more fundamental change in women's status socially, economically um, and indeed sexually. It was no coincidence that at this time, women, and many of them were members of the Freedom League, were explicitly discussing the concept of feminism, what feminism meant, this relatively new term, this new word. They were discussing it. They were referring at the time to a wider women's movement, a wider feminist movement. And perhaps it was a deeper feminist conviction that attracted Muriel Matters to the Women's Freedom League. We know that she turned her back on the WSPU and the Pankhursts, and she became a paid organiser for the Women's Freedom League. And she helped to expand its regional branch network from 12 to, to, to um, many, many more. Um, I'm going to mention this. Um, Muriel is linked to another suffrage, suffragette innovation, um, caravanning. In 1908 and 1909, she embarked on a speaking tour in different parts of England to build up the branch network, um, traveling from place to place in a specially um, 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 painted um, caravan um, with women's suffrage, votes for women on the side. And it was, it was these types of activities that, that Muriel um, took part in that did build up the, the, the branch network of the, the Women's Freedom League. It's a useful reminder as well, I think, that women's suffrage was a nationwide movement in Britain. It didn't just play out in, in London. So perhaps you're thinking, OK, so there were different militant societies. There were feminists, there were suffragettes. But what difference, maybe you're saying, did this actually make to how women like Muriel campaigned for the vote? Well, the difference, I think, um, was significant. And it's much more than most popular histories of women's suffrage have acknowledged. I was here at slightly early tonight and I went to the bookshop on the corner. Um, I'm sure most many of us have been in there, the, part of the House of Commons or the House of Parliament bookshop. And there was um, a new book on, on um, women's movement and um, feminism in there. And um, I always check the index and there's one reference, one note to the Women's Freedom League in it. Um, that, I'm afraid, is um, how under-acknowledged um, 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 what I'm going to talk about is in popular history. The Women's Freedom League refused to adopt or sponsor any suffragette militancy that resulted in the destruction of property. 
So all incidents of window smashing, of arson, please put those from your mind. They were all down to uh, members of the Women's Social and Political Union. This um, has led to the Women's Freedom League sometimes being described as less militant than the WSPU, and I, I think that's open to debate. On one level, yes, if we accept a narrow definition of militancy as violence, perhaps, but I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that suffragette militancy, that concept of militancy, had other meanings. For Muriel and others in the Women's Freedom League, militancy wasn't about the destruction of property or even about women's bodily sacrifice through, through imprisonment and hunger striking. First and foremost, for them, it, 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 they felt it should be a demonstration of their refusal to accept what they considered to be unlawful government. I'll explain, I'll explain that a little more. Teresa Billington Grieg, and we've all got favourite, I think, favourite suffrage activists, and she um, is probably one of mine. She was an uh, architect of the Women's Freedom League's early militant policy. She argued women had no choice but to revolt against the laws and systems that were illegally forced upon them. Her rationale was based on a reading of citizenship as a combination of responsibilities and rights. She argued it was illegal to require women to accept all the responsibilities of citizenship, such as the rule of law and taxation, but to withhold from them the rights of citizenship, for example, and, that, and what she meant there was political representation, the vote. Militant protests, she believed, should emphasise women's refusal to recognise the false authority of male government and to demonstrate the consequences to society of women's votelessness. So in, in 1908, she, she told her colleagues at uh, uh, the annual conference of the Women's Freedom League to be, and I'm quoting her now, be as militant as you like. Do anything from police court protests to blowing up the Houses of Parliament. Well, she didn't. They didn't. Parliament is still standing, just, apparently, um, if the repair bill reports are to be believed. But the focus on Parliament... I think in, in, in Billington Greek's um, words was significant since, yes, of course, it represented for suffragettes as for generations of protesters before and, and since the ultimate symbol of parliamentary authority in, in, in Britain and indeed um, for the wider empire at the time as well. So the Houses of Parliament were, of course, an, um, a compelling and natural um, choice, a venue for suffrage protests. And it was here that some of the most powerful symbolic and dramatic acts of militancy occurred. It was Muriel, along with about 20 other members of the Women's Freedom League, who planned and executed what was considered by many to be one of the most audacious of these protests in October 1908. Um, here is an image recreated and, and printed in one of the daily um, newspapers. Um, I'm not going to go into detail because um, it's, going to be, um, it's going to be covered, I hope, in, in the film you're about to see. What I will say is that it, as an attack on a despised symbol of women's exclusion from political discourse, it was a highly effective and um, incredibly successful act of suffrage militancy. Um, I have to put this up. Um, Melanie will recognise it. Um, there's a great story. This is the original proclamation that was unfurled um, as part of the grill protest. Um, and the reason we have, we ha I can show you a picture of it, not the original, is because um, in the in the the, the struggle to, to to remove the women protesters from the the ladies' gallery, um, this this proclamation was 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 wrenched from the arms of one of the protesters and bundled up and put in a cupboard. This is right, isn't it, Melanie? And there it lay, and it wasn't um, until many years later that it was, um, that it was rediscovered. Muriel seems to have relished risky, media-savvy, if I can say that, protests. Here she is in 1909 um, on another challenge. She was crossing London in, yes, a Votes for Women airship. Um, dropping, dropping pamphlets um, as, as she went. There's lots of this kind of information about, about Muriel on um, a website dedicated to her that's uh, um, based um, in Australia, the Muriel Matters Society, but there's lots of terrific information um, 
on that website. Yes, these kind of protests, they made great theatre, and they shocked the establishment, believe me. However, women like Muriel took other steps to demonstrate their rejection of the authority of a government in which women had no part in electing. For example, the members of the Women's Freedom League encouraged their members to withhold their taxes, to take part, to resist paying their taxes, and, and, and many did. Um, I've put up here, I'm not sure if you can read it, it's an extract from the League's newspaper, The Vote, um, and its president, Charlotte Despard, is justifying her reasons for resisting her taxes. Um, she, um, in her letter, um, um, refusing to pay, um, and I quote, she says, I absolutely refuse to pay my share of the imperial taxes until the right to citizenship, which is really and logically mine, is recognised. Many other women followed her example. Um, so much so that in 1909, a new society, the Women's Tax Resistance League, was formed, and we know that in 1911, Muriel Matters was working for them as a paid organiser. Um, the Women's Tax Resistance League is very interesting because it attracted women from the constitutional wing of the women's suffrage movement to, to resist, and they called themselves law-abiding, but members of their society broke the law by resisting their taxes. Tax resistance could and did put resistors at risk of prison, but it didn't carry a significant risk of violence as other forms of um, WSPU militancy did. And perhaps for this reason, it was um, popular with, with you know, significant numbers. In 1911, the Women's Freedom League initiated another highly symbolic <coughs> protest against women's what they thought women's ambiguous legal and political status. They asked their members to take part in a mass boycott of the 1911 census. They advised um, members to absent themselves in their home, and this is, I think, a reconstruction of one of these um, events where women absented themselves um, on census night. Um, others simply refused to fill out their census um, returns. It was, um, it was a protest that captured the imagination of, of, of the wider suffrage movement and the, the Women's Social and Political Union followed suit and, and encouraged their members to boycott the census as well. As a result of this, this, this protest, thousands of census returns from 1911 are, are still incomplete. Um, I've put up here for you Muriel Matter's own census return. And you can probably see she's written across it, no vote, no census. And, and further um, across she writes, as I am not a person under the franchise laws, I am not a person for census purposes. Many others. Um, Many others followed her lead. This is one of my favourites. I'm running out of time. I, don't, I, won't, I won't go into it now. But um, for those of you who, who do use 1911 for, for your own research, bear in mind it, um, it is um, incomplete. So that was a whistle-stop tour, a brief overview of um, the Women's Freedom League's campaign um, um, in the pre-war period. And I hope what I've demonstrated is there is an alternative narrative to suffragette militancy. It was militancy, yes, with noble aspirations, but it was a product of debate and discussion among women from all walks of life. It deserves, I think, far more recognition than it has received. I'm going to finish, um, as all academics do, by stressing how much more I could tell you, how much more I could say. Uh, um, a few, few examples up here. The Women's Freedom League consistently targeted police courts, courts of justice, to highlight the unequal treatment of women. And they continue to do this after the outbreak of the First World War. Other members continue to resist to pay their taxes throughout the duration of the war, and some until, um, not, waited until 1918 when partial enfranchisement was um, finally secured. So this idea that everything stopped, militancy stopped um, on the outbreak of war. Um, don't, don't believe it. Don't believe everything you read. Muriel Matter's story obviously continues as well, and hers is a very interesting one. She was involved in the women's peace movement during the war. Um, she tried to attend. She was very instrumental in, in organising the, the, the delegation of British women um, to go over to The Hague. She tried to attend, but uh, along with her and her... Um, associates uh, couldn't get over the channel in April 1915. 
And of course, um, this point is important. We shouldn't presume that Muriel is only defined by her involvement in the pre-war suffrage campaign. She continued to be deeply politically aware, politically motivated for the remainder of her life. Um, she just stood for Parliament in, 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 uh, 19, uh, in the 1920s and 1924 in Hastings as, as a Labour um, candidate. So lots more to, to her story than I've been able to tell you. Um, hopefully we'll hear more in the film. So for this and many other reasons, Muriel Matters. I hope you enjoy the film and um, I'll be happy to, to take questions or um, uh, take part in the discussion after the film. So thank you, everyone. Shame to say, I had never heard of Muriel Matters before I was contacted to to speak here tonight. Um, and as a former actor from Australia, who's now deeply entrenched in UK politics, I, I can't think why I was asked to introduce this film, <laughs> but I have been absolutely delighted to do so. Uh, it's actually pretty spooky, as another great Australian export would say, Dame Edna. Um, the you know uh, Muriel actually spent some time in Perth, which is where I grew up. In Western Australia, although she was born in South Australia, uh, and acted there for a short time, so <laughs> it's really quite a coincidence. And what an amazing woman! What an amazing woman! A real unsung hero, even more so in Australia, as I, as I think I mentioned before. But her actions really helped to change the course of, of women's history. Uh, a story full of daring and drama, and uh, it absolutely deserves to be up in lights. I think she took suffrage to a new level. Hundreds of feet high, in fact, uh, in that airship with uh, votes for women emblazoned on it. Uh, I've been asked to say just a couple of minutes, uh, speak for a couple of minutes about my own experience of entering politics. I have to say it's far less dramatic than Muriel's. Um, I dropped letters through a, a leaflet through a letterbox rather than from a balloon. Uh, as I say, I grew up in Perth, uh, where amongst other roles I worked as a professional actor. Uh, but within a few years of settling in Scotland, I joined the SNP, because I wanted to help build a fairer country uh, where the next generation, like my own two daughters, could know no limit to their ambitions. Uh, in 2007, I was elected as a councillor in the city of Edinburgh, uh, including work as convener of culture and sport for five years. Then came the elections last May, and another Aussie woman's here in London uh, speaking up for a cause. Now, I'm very proud of my political achievements so far, but I am aware they are absolutely built on the back of women like Muriel Matters. She is an incredible trailblazer, and I am absolutely thrilled that this film has been made and to see you all here tonight and to hear Claire too. Um, and I'm glad to see you all enjoyed it. That was fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I must also uh, thank the Speaker's Advisory Committee on Works of Art and Vote 100 for making tonight possible. Uh, I also must thank again the Rivet Picture Company, Ronan Films, for allowing us to show the film. Um, and of course, I must uh, pay special um, mention to Francis Bedford and Steph Key, uh, who will probably be watching this, I'm pretty certain, once it's put up on YouTube, um, because uh, so much of this is due to their hard work and the efforts of, of people around them uh, in the Muriel Matters Society. And I must also thank Melanie, too, for being very, very helpful. And thank you all for coming along tonight. It was a great evening. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. And uh, do get home safely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.